Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. For more than 30 years, this TV series has explored a wide variety of issues related to peace, social justice, economic justice, the environment, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide opportunities for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. This month, we will explore how our nation conducts elections. We'll identify several kinds of problems and propose solutions that would increase democracy and fairness. The U.S. officially brags about being the world's greatest democracy, but voter turnout in the U.S. is very low compared to other nations. Rich people and big businesses fund campaigns that result in governmental corruption. Most Americans express disgust that the people that we elect do not represent us well. People who are already suffering discrimination are also restricted from voting. There are other problems too. We'll explore these kinds of problems and we'll explore positive solutions. We have three guests to help us do that. All three of our guests are active with nonprofit organizations that are working to reform elections and improve democracy. I'm happy to welcome Bree Weeder. She's active with the Washington Voting Justice Coalition. Hi. Good to have you here, Bree. Colin Cole is uh, active with Fair Vote Washington. Hi. Pleasure Good to have you. Here. Thanks. And Cindy Black is active with Fix Democracy First. Cindy, good to have you here. So we will have a good time actually exploring this important topic because what we have are some important critiques and some important remedies. So this will be a good use of our time. <clears throat> when I introduced this program, I mentioned just a few of the problems that the American people have been experiencing regarding our nation's electoral systems. And I wonder, uh, Colin, if you could amplify any of those problems or identify any others. So the basic uh, problem we have with our elections right now is a lot of people generally just don't feel very good about it. Uh, the vast majority of United States congressional districts, for instance, aren't competitive. We can already call five years out who's going to be the winner. Uh, you have situations where you have folks who aren't actually receiving the majority of votes uh, who are still being put into offices, uh, and not just at a national level, but even here locally, too. Uh, and so just in general, we have a lot of issues that need to be repaired to make our democracy function a little better. Yeah, Great. thanks. Uh, Bria, I, I wonder how do you uh, perceive that the American people's feelings are about uh, the nation's electoral systems or people's feelings about any aspects of our electoral system? There's a general feeling and sense right now that our current system is not working for the majority of people. Um, so I would say it's not great. And that's a really unfortunate fact, especially in communities of color, where we have seen people be historically marginalized. My grandmother wasn't allowed to vote until she was almost 30 years old, uh -huh. which is blasphemy as a United States citizen. So there is historical trauma um, that is really built into the feeling. And I feel like it is within this last election has just been amplified to a degree with the general public that we've never seen before. Yeah, the, the people who get picked on are just getting picked on worse exactly. and worse in every possible way, exactly. including the electoral yes. systems. Yes, exactly. So um, in order to solve problems in, in any aspect of public mm -hmm. policy, I think it's good to start by identifying what our core values are, the basic principles mm -hmm. that should be guiding us as we devise solutions to, to public policy decisions. Um, so that we can have solutions that really will be um, ethical and deeply satisfying. Uh, Bria, could you identify some core values that you think should be the basis sure. for how we practice democracy? Yeah, happy to do that. First thing that jumps to my mind, um, especially in light of the uh, hearing that happened with James Comey, is honesty. Uh, there is this general feeling that the electoral that the early June, early 2017, June 2017 and, and the, ongoing, um, process, and the yeah. ongoing process with that is that people right now really feel that elected politicians and the electoral system is not honest. We also want fairness. Uh, we want to make sure that people really feel like when they're going to cast their vote, that they are going to be electing people that represent them and represent their values. And then, of course, we want equity. Um, we know that people of color represent almost 30 percent 
of the population of this country and here in Washington state, and we are nowhere near electing proportional amounts of people of color, even women, there's nowhere near 50% of women that hold elected office in any level, and we are almost 51% of the population yeah. of this country. Yeah, and it's pretty top heavy with lawyers. Exactly. Pretty top heavy exactly. with people with business backgrounds. Pretty, yeah, and rich people. Money. We're pretty short on poets. Exactly. Pretty short on social workers. Pretty short on some other. We need diversity of not only just traditional ways that people in this country think about diversity, but diversity of thought. Yeah. as well. You know, yeah. if we get teachers, if we get social workers, we're going to have firefighters, a way more broad scale of values across yeah. the spectrum. And I know that <laughs> Colin and Cindy are going to be talking about this as well, but it also with the fairness part, you have to be rich to run for office in this country. Yeah. There's yeah. no way that you can run and win if you do not have money. Yeah, or have friends who exactly. are money responsors. Exactly. Yeah. In, in just a couple of minutes, we'll be talking about yeah. financing the campaigns and we'll get into mm -hmm. this some more. Um, and, and at that point, we'll, we'll also be talking, uh, well, we'll be mentioning this concept called corporate personhood, yes. which is part of <laughs> what ails mm -hmm. us. Uh, so let, let's just identify that, that concept of corporate personhood right now. So we'll have that in mind. Uh, Cindy, could you like clue us in as to what that concept means? So basically corporate personhood, um, so back in 1886, there was a court decision, sent, um, the Santa Clara um, versus the Southern Pacific. And basically under the 14th Amendment, um, basically they said that um, uh, corporations had the same rights as people under the Protection Clause. Mm -hmm. And so they had the same constitutional rights. And so since then we've seen kind of this deliberate attempt to undermine democracy and give more power to the corporations, and they've, they've taken over in a big way. Yeah, and we, we actually did one of our TV programs a full hour really getting into some depth about corporate personhood. Um, I produced and hosted this for the March 2011 program in this TV series, and you can watch it through the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation's website, www.olympiafor.org. Uh, visit that website, click TV program, scroll down to the March 2011 program, and then click the program title, Real Democracy, Not Corporate Personhood. And we really get into some good depth about that. Um, so Cindy, as a background to our conversation about how we finance elections, uh, there's a, another factor involved. There was, there was a memo written by Lewis Powell. Uh, he, shortly before he became a US Supreme Court Justice in 1971, uh, he uh, wrote a confidential memorandum to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, one of the most powerful organizations representing big business. What did the Powell memo, memo say, and why was this important? Well, basically, he titled it Attack on American Free Enter or American Enterprise System. So basically, he called on uh, business owners and corporate interests to get involved politically on all levels. There was a concern that social justice issues were taking over and the business was getting lost and they didn't want the corporations to be sidelined and so they took on um, and they, they embraced this memo and they mm -hmm. have ever since where they have taken over corporations in, in laws, whether it's a law, whether it's a regulation, whatever it is, they've gotten their hands in it. Yeah. Um, people talk about dark money in elections, mm -hmm. and this feeds right into that. Can you tell us what that term dark money means and, and what, what the effect that has on elections? Well, dark money is basically we don't know where it comes from. And after the Citizens United decision in 2010, we saw the creation of what's called super PACs, which is, is basically a way to funnel all kinds of money. And uh -huh. we don't know where it comes from because it, the organization hides it from the donors. Yeah. It could be foreign donors, corporations, we don't know. Yeah, Yeah, it seems like every time we come up with some reform, they find some way to get around that. So even the PAC, you mentioned super PACs, there were, before that, there were just ordinary PACs. Yep. PACs were created to try to have some honesty and accountability, mm -hmm. and that got corrupted. I mean, so every reform, unless the people take things back again, uh, we're just gonna have one kind of corruption after another. Yes. And we've had this sequence of US Supreme Court decisions, I hope you'll summarize, um, court decisions that have increased the power of big money dominating elections. 
uh, a lot of people know about the uh, Citizens United decision, which you mentioned. That was 2010. Fewer people remember the 1976 Buckley versus Vallejo decision. And then we had in 2014 the McCutcheon versus FEC decision. Can you summarize without a lot of detail, but the, the sense of what these Supreme Court decisions were doing? Well, basically with Buckley versus Vallejo, they equated money as free speech and that you could spend your money in elections. And so they equated that, that with that. And then with the McCutcheon decision, that took where they used to have limits for individuals, what they could um, um, put out or contribute to an election and basically got rid of that and said it was unconstitutional and that wealthy individuals can also spend as much money as they yeah. want in elections. So, so the floodgates have really been open hugely. In massive uh, ways through these Supreme Court decisions and through the Powell memo mm -hmm. and all that kind of thinking about having business corporations really dominate our nation in, in those ways. Yeah. And if I might add, some of the protections that are supposed to be in place uh, are also just laughable. Uh, way back in early 2010, 2011, uh, Stephen Colbert did an ongoing journalism segment. He actually won a Peabody for it, uh, looking at super PACs and how that actual system yeah. worked. Um, and they were able to flagrantly get around the coordination rules just on air talking to the candidates that they weren't supposed to be coordinating with. Uh, uh -huh. And it, people can just do what they want with yeah. these super PACs and there's no accountability. Yeah, and, and the, within the federal government there have been uh, uh, diminished opportunities for the kind of regulation we need. Uh, federal Election Commission has been basically taken over and by, by the Republican Party and frozen out of any kind of effectiveness, and this has happened. This case after case, they got existing regulation too, mm -hmm. completely. Yeah, yeah. And what we saw with when when Trump took power, he's just been waiving ethical regulations and say, well, that doesn't pertain to me. Doesn't pertain to anybody that works for me. You know, this is very broad. The president attempt. can't have a conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just mm. amazing stuff. Um, uh, Colin, I, w I wonder if you could address something else. Um, people have been working for public funding nationwide, mm -hmm. and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, for a number of years here in Washington State, we had a nonprofit group, Washington Public Campaigns, which later became the group that Cindy is with. Um, and that group evolved into Fixed Democracy First. Um, and can, can you just say something else about the background of uh, public funding, and then we'll talk with Cindy about things. Yeah, sure. So. Public funding of campaigns is something that isn't really a radical idea. A lot of other countries around the world use it, and we're using it in several places around America, for instance, in the city of Seattle. Uh, and the basic idea is trying to combat that idea that Bree mentioned, where you need to be rich to run for office. And that shouldn't be the case. We should want our best citizens who represent our communities to be able to seek office. So by trying to find ways to publicly finance campaigns, we can kind of remove that as a barrier, and we can allow ways for folks who aren't as wealthy to be a full-time campaign operative to run for office. Great, okay. So um, we'll be having some information from Cindy here. Uh, Supreme Court decisions have been assuming that corporate personhood is a valid concept, mm -hmm. and it's okay for big money to fund the campaigns. And the only way to fix those two systemic problems would be to amend the U.S. Constitution to explicitly say corporations are not persons. You know, they have a there's that concept that they're illegal persons. They can mm -hmm. sign contracts that's right. and stuff, but that doesn't mean that they get all the constitutional human rights, and that's the distinction. So co corporations are not persons, and money is not speech. So that leads people to saying we should have an amendment to the Constitution, because it's not something that Congress could just do of their own volition when it's the Supreme Court decision that put those concepts in place. So tell us about the proposal for a 28th Amendment. Well, what's interesting is the majority of amendments that we have to the constitutions were to correct court decisions, a lot of them, because the court would tend to, for the poll tax, for example, or the women's right to vote. The court had held those two things that they were perfectly legal to yeah. do. Excluding it, women. Yeah, excluding and, women yeah. And, and charging people yeah. to pay yeah. to vote were yeah. perfectly legal. So it took constitutional amendments to overturn those court decisions. And we see the same thing happening here. Um, one of the only ways we can do that is with a constitutional amendment to overturn turn these decisions. So that's why we're, we're pursuing that effort. Because yeah. uh, we see that as one of our only avenues to 
stop the onslaught of these decisions. And there's more coming too. Yeah, and and that's really a nationwide thing. I know that you're yes. working on that here in Washington State through our local organization, and this is nationwide. What are some some of the things that people are pursuing across the country to make this happen? Well. Yeah, um, for example, um, states across the country are calling for like resolutions or um, initiatives that would put their state on record calling for a constitutional amendment. So there's 19 states that have done it. Washington, we became 18 last year in November 2016. And just this, in the last few weeks, Nevada became the 19th in, in, state. Uh, late May or very early yep, June. Just in the last few weeks, yep. Yeah. And so that's one way the states are doing it is there, there's grassroots yeah. movement uh, with organizations and volunteers on the ground trying to make this happen, yeah. prepare their states for ratification, and also put pressure on their congressional delegation to put forth an amendment. Because there's only two ways we can get an amendment. One is through our congressional delegation. The other is through an Article 5 convention, which we've never done before. Yeah. Though we can use it as a threat maybe, but we've yeah. never used that option. Because that option would open things up and then mm -hmm. who knows what kind of screwy it things could. the right wing could, <laughs> it could write into the Constitution. There are some people that argue that you can, we can be very specific about what we go forth with the Article 5, but there's other folks that are really wary right now about what might happen yeah, if we do no, that. Knowing how dominant the right wing is, they could impose some really horrendous things, things beyond Trump's worst oh, sure. dreams. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so the, the, the main approach seems to be by having state by state by state say we're on record, we want this, and then push on our congressional delegation to move ahead with. Yeah, and with, there are several um, bills in um, the House right now, and the one in particular that we're looking at is House Joint Resolution 48 that reflects the language of the initiative that we passed last year that calls for um, the uh, an amendment to the Constitution. Yeah, a different, uh, when I've read up on this uh, over the years, uh, it looks like people are trying to figure out what's the best wording and then use that same wording state after state after state so that there's uh, uh, kind of a convergence of what the best wording is so we don't end up with too much uh, there's a lot of debate over weirdness. the language we're yeah. not quite there yet um, there's some debate over some people don't want to include corporate personhood but the majority of us do yeah. Yeah. because they're afraid that well they should have some rights and we're not saying they shouldn't have some rights but they should not have constitutional rights yeah. because in the first 150 plus years of this country yeah. corporations were not treated yeah. the way they are now yeah. Yeah, human rights are for human beings that we're quite different. With a belly button. Yes. If you yes, have a belly yeah, button, yeah. yes. So, uh, Colin, I want to check with you about something that you had mentioned during the phone conversation sure. we had to prepare for this. Uh, you pointed out the problem that sometimes people get elected even though they did not receive a majority of votes. Yeah. And uh, what causes that problem? Yeah, so overall, it's just a, a root of one of the, the biggest problems I think we have here in American democracy, which is sort of our first-past-the-post system. Uh, and what that is, is it's our electoral system where the first person to get the majority of the votes, or the most votes, wins. So uh, which, it's, a, it's a plurality, not even a majority. Right, then. so this like one. here locally in the city of Seattle, <laughs> uh, we have what's called a jungle primary, which means the top two vote-getters are going to advance to the general election. But we also have something like 17, 23 candidates. 21. 21. So yeah. you can have two people who both get 15% of the vote, meaning 85% of the city voted against them, and they can be the only two options that are on the ballot. And we had the same thing in Maine last year, uh -huh. uh, in 2016, and in 2012, where their governor was elected with uh, just a one-third of the votes of the state. Yeah. yeah, that Maine case is an odd thing. I've told some of my friends about that. This, this guy is um, a real mean-spirited extremist. I'm trying to think of what I could say on TV, uh, but but he, he's, he's really quite an extremist and very mean-spirited, intensely disliked by huge numbers of people, but the, they, the two decent candidates that run get like some votes. Like 33 and 35. Yeah, yeah and then this guy happens to get a bit more than the two decent candidates, so this wacko gets elected time after time, even though the vast majority of people want these two decent. Right. In, in 2016, he had 37% of the vote. Yeah, and got elected. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that instead of um, just being able to get elected because you got more than somebody else, more than anybody else, 
we need a system that will actually make sure that there is a majority for somebody sure. before that person is. And that has been referred to as ranked choice voting. Yeah. It's also been referred to as instant runoff. So instead of waiting through a, a primary and then doing a runoff election, it's an instant runoff mm -hmm. or it's ranked choice where you just rank your candidates. Tell us, can you walk us through how that works? Yeah, so uh, on its surface, it might sound like it's a complicated thing. So you're going to even to rank multiple candidates and compare them, uh, but ranking things in order of preference is something we do every day. If you're talking with your friends about what restaurant you should eat at, everyone kind of says, oh, well, this is my first choice as long as it's not that. Uh, and this is kind of how we think about voting. But unfortunately, because we have that system where you only get one vote and whoever gets the most wins, we're encouraged to vote against the candidates that we don't like rather than for the candidates we do. And this affects folks on both sides of the spectrum. If you're in uh, the year 1992 and you really like Ross Perot, voting for him uh, ends up hurting your more conservative cause because it guarantees the election of Bill Clinton. If it's the year 2000 and you're a Green Party supporter for Ralph Nader down in Florida, your support of the candidate that you like best actually guarantees the candidate you disagree with the most gets elected. But if we had a ranked choice system where you could put them order of preference, you could say number one Ross Perot, number two George Bush, or number one Ralph Nader, number two Al Gore, you're no longer hurting your own side because you're voting for the candidate you like the most. And in a democracy, you should be able to vote for the candidate you like the most without feeling bad about it. Yeah, so the way it works then is if I, if there are, say there are five people running, and I go, well, this, this one would be my first choice, this is my second choice, this would be my third choice, those other two I don't want at all. Right. Okay, so the, if, the, my, if my first choice doesn't, doesn't prevail mm -hmm. and, and drops off, the bottom, the bottom vote getter drops right, off. Right, the least popular candidate. Then my second choice candidate gets my vote. Right. And, and it, this might go through several iterations, right? And finally, you end up with somebody who is acceptable to a majority right. of people. And uh, it's also worth noting that uh, this isn't, uh, again, a radical idea. We have organizations and institutions around the country that use this for their own internal elections. College boards use it all the time. A number of uh, cities and counties are across the country and the state of Maine as of 2016 have adopted it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really not a radical reform. There, there, there's a, an, an interesting aspect of it that I think you had mentioned on the phone when we were preparing for the interview, and I've seen this in other uh, things I've studied up about it, where it tends to reduce the amount of negative campaigning. One of the right. things that people hate about elections is all that mean spirited negative mm -hmm. campaigning. But if, if, if the four of us are running for office, mm -hmm. running for the same office, and, and I think Bree is, is a jerk, and I'm bad-mouthing Bree, then what I'm doing is I'm antagonizing the people who want Bree to get right. elected, and they're not gonna mark me as their second choice. They're gonna mark, right. gonna mark you or you. So I need to debate with Bree about the issues yes. and not just call her names mm -hmm. or say that she's a crook or she's a sleazeball or something. Right. We gotta get into the issues because I want people who, if Bree is not one of the top mm -hmm. vote getters, I want her people to choose me as a mm -hmm. second choice. Right. And there's actually been research done on this subject in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where they uh, have ranked choice voting for their local elections. Uh, they've, there's been research done that shows that actually the amount of negative ads has decreased. Uh -huh. uh, and after talking to some of the candidates, it kind of becomes clear why, because it used to be if you're out knocking doors trying to talk to voters, you see a yard sign for your opponent, oh, you didn't just mark that person off, you go to the next door, uh -huh. and they're your enemy. And that kind of increases the polarization of our country. Whereas now, you see the yard sign for your opponent, you can knock on their door and say, hey, I see you support this person, that's great. I'd love to be your second choice. And that can actually be meaningful. Yeah. Uh, and now you have an incentive to not just demonize the other side and to talk to each other. Right, and so that, that helps us counter one of the problems that we identified early in the program, or maybe we didn't <laughs> identify, which is the polarization that exists. Right. Because this helps us move toward closer to a consensus. There's a, a, a video, um, a four minute video that clearly explains and shows how to do this. It's very easy to understand and I boil it down into one of these tiny Earl things. So I'll get a pen or a pencil and I'll read this off to you. You can write it down and watch it at your convenience. Um, it's www.tinyearl, so uh, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com and a forward slash, the letter Y, the letter B, O, O, W, six, three, R. 
and that'll take you to a link that shows this four minute video that just clearly explains how that works. So that's a cool thing to do. Um, there was an experiment in Pierce County, the mm -hmm. county with Tacoma, Washington in it. Um, and can you tell us what happened? And we're kind of tight on time, but if you can yeah. summarize what that experience was so that people don't get the wrong lesson from what happened. Sure, so very briefly, uh, in 2006, Washington State had kind of tossed out uh, the primary system that we used, and Pierce County was looking for an alternative. So they adopted ranked choice voting as their default way of doing elections. Uh, but then in 2007, the Supreme Court uh, was bringing the primary back in. Uh, and the voters of Pierce County ended up reversing it, uh, partially because it wasn't as necessary, but also there was kind of a, a botched rollout. It was explained very poorly. Folks had two sets of ballots. They had to fill out separately, return separately with two separate stamps. Uh, and it's an issue with the rollout, not an issue with the system. Uh, and really, it's designed to save time, and they were using outdated voting machines, so they had to count all the ballots by hand. Uh, so on the part of uh, Pierce County, uh, their, their effort wasn't uh, a really good example of what ranked choice voting can do. Yeah, it was just a botched implementation right. of what could have been a good system. Yeah. Um, I want to check with you about something else, uh, Colin. There's a different kind of problem where governing bodies fail to reflect the, the political diversity among the population, and the remedy is something called proportional representation. Right. Tell us about that concept. Yeah, so basically, uh, this isn't a, re a revolutionary concept either, but when you think about it, the general views of a population should reflect the views of the folks who are elected to represent that body. So if you live in a district uh, you know, where 60% view one way, uh, about 60% of the uh, elected officials should view that way. But again, because of this first-past-the-post system, the majority of places you live in America only reflect one viewpoint. And if you're a liberal Democrat in rural Texas, or if you're a hardcore conservative and you're living in the heart of San Francisco, odds are you don't have anybody representing you at the US Congress or your local elections. Uh, proportional voting allows us to break down these districts into wider, grab, uh, wider groups so that we can start bringing forth more representatives so that everyone has at least one person representing their viewpoint in their local elected office. So you might have a jurisdiction that has, instead of separate individual districts with one person each, you might have a larger area right. with multiple people elected and then allocated proportionally by party or by... Right, or by vote. Uh, there's actually a, a graphic coming up a little later on the program, and uh, we can revisit this topic then, but uh, you, can, you can do it based off of uh, the population uh, and just kind of make our districts the way we currently have them a little bit bigger. Uh -huh. Um, there's another perversion of the spirit of democracy that happens, there are so many, uh, and that's when one political p party has the power to draw the lines that define electoral districts in order to benefit that party that has the power. And this happens a lot, it's called gerrymandering. And can you tell us about the abuse, and I will hold an, a visual image that illustrates an example. Sure. Uh, so, so gerrymandering is uh, effectively what you just succinctly said, uh, drawing the districts with an intent to give one party an advantage or the other, uh, or uh, to give one uh, particular group of people an advantage. There's all sorts of racial gerrymandering, which sure. uh, yeah. I'm not a super expert on, but uh, we'll have some more elaboration on that yeah. in a little bit. Um, and so as you can see here, these, these districts are kind of, they're not compact. Uh, it seems like they were, they're drawn to be uh, kind of wonky. Yeah. Um. Well, they, they're, they're drawn, these are actual congressional districts, and I can see the, uh, one of them, the one on the left, I can see there's a city named there, it, uh, and it, it's in Texas. It's uh, San, looks like it's San Antonio, but the, it's kind of blurred. And the other one is another congressional district someplace. But you would think that you'd want to have a congressional district that's pretty compact, has pretty understandable boundaries. And these were drawn by the dominant political party in Texas to advantage itself and to elbow other people out of the way. Right. Uh, and this is, and these are two, congress, two actual congressional districts, uh, clearly an affront to any kind of fairness right. and, re and decent representation. Um, and then you provided a visual image that we will show on the screen. Sure. To, people at home 
Um, the, the, this, the, what you're showing is four ways to draw district lines. If you have 60% of the people who are, say, blue in this example, right. and 40% of the voters are red, can you walk us through these four diagrams and tell us what we see? Yeah. Now, first of all, I want to mention I wish it was you know yellow and orange yeah, or purple. So, yeah, because <laughs> we're not trying to blame any particular party. Right. They should have used different colors. I thought about that too. Uh, but you can you can imagine that in this area you would want about 60% of the representatives to be blue and 40% red. Uh, and there's a way to draw that district, which you see under number one, uh, where you draw it into five districts. And then as a result, you end up getting three representatives that are blue, two that are red, which matches the proportion of the population. Yeah. But it's a weird looking district. Uh, in number two, you can see where you have some very compact districts. They are drawn to be small, but they're icing out 40% uh, of the voters who now have zero representation. Uh, and in number three, you can find that it's actually possible to disadvantage the majority so that even though only 40% of the voters are of one party, uh, they actually have the majority of the seats. Uh, and these are huge problems with the way that we currently draw our districts, uh, which is why uh, proportional representation, if you look at that first graph, where it says 60% blue, 40% red, wow. what proportional representation would suggest is instead of breaking this up into five districts, let's call it one district that re elects five people. Yeah. Uh, and then you end up getting a, a much fairer representation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the one on the right is, is the, the, the gerrymandered one by the minority party. Right. And it's worth noting this happens in the country all over the place. Yeah. Again, both at the local level yeah. uh, and at the national level. And you have an example within the state of Washington. I do. And tell us about that. Yeah, so it's really interesting because in the state of Washington, we have a nonpartisan redistricting commission but the people that are elected to that commission get chosen by the legislature. So oftentimes there still is partisan impact, even though it's supposed to be a quote unquote nonpartisan way of getting our district's lines drawn. And so what we see currently is a place like Yakima in Eastern Washington, uh, which is majority Latino, uh, Latina. And they currently have not, until very recently, um, their municipal government was at large. Uh, which is goes back to the problem you were talking about earlier. I can discuss this a little bit more when I talk about the Voting Rights Act later, but um, over 90% of local elections in Washington state are at large. Um, and so this plays perfectly into what Colin was talking about, which is that um, people's interest in uh, representation is not fair when we do at large elections. And so what we saw very recently in Yakima, um, until organizers were out there and actually changed the districts to have it be um, broken down into five different council seats, was that there were absolutely no Latinos elected into any kind of local office in Yakima, even though they are 60% of the population. Yeah. So let's just let that sit for a second. <laughs> that 60% of the population of a city did not have any sort of representation. Yeah. And what we saw was when the districts were redrawn, um, four out of the five um, council seats were actually, are now being held by young Latina women. So this just kind of shows the direct um, and really yeah. instant impact that having, making sure that we aren't gerrymandering, making sure that our redistricting commissions are actually fair and nonpartisan, mm -hmm. and how that can change completely who is representing the people in office. Yeah, and also shows the value of the ACLU exactly. of Washington, which had worked really hard on this. Yes. And other people who, who really work well for, for voting rights. I will just say that um, One America, which is a great yes. immigration organization, they were the, actually the ones that were on the ground um, and going and knocking and talking yeah. to the citizens of Yakima uh, to make sure that they actually knew what was going on and talking to them about the impact. So the ACLU, um, One America, yeah. hats off to them. They have really yeah. shown that this is possible and they They've shown us a model that can be replicated throughout the state of Washington. Yeah, One America does excellent work they do. on a yes, bunch they of do. things. Uh, and actually, the, the model that was used in Yakima is currently being looked at up in Everett, where I'm from, uh, where there's a campaign to redistrict the city right now as well, uh, because similarly, uh, the vast majority of the city council candidates come from the one district in town, uh, and there's a, a bunch of districts, primarily the more poor neighborhoods and the minority districts that have no representation. I'll bet. I grew up in Everett, and I know there's stratification there. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to explore something else with you, Bree. Sure. Uh, you've been working um, on um, clarifying and debunking yes. these allegations of voter fraud. Yes. And we've heard this in, 
increasingly in recent years, mm -hmm. uh, the allegation that there's all these <laughs> non-people voting mm -hmm. or everybody's registering as Minnie Mouse or what? I, yes. You know, tell, tell us about this this voter fraud scam. It really is a scam. Yes. Um, so and then we'll, then we'll talk about the remedy. Okay, sure. Um, so voter fraud is definitely something that was used a lot in 2016 leading up to the election. Um, and what we know is that voter fraud doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, that kind of voter fraud. Yes, Not exactly. That kind. Right. Yeah, a there's a different kind. There's yeah. a flip to that. <laughs> yeah. But we are, studies have shown um, that voter fraud just it does not happen yeah. in this country at any kind of statistically significant proportion that would make yeah. it a real issue. Yeah, what we're the, seeing is voter suppression. Right. So the, this what's being alleged is that like um, I'm voting even though uh, I'm, I'm not really registered there. Mm -hmm. I'm voting three times or I'm no. that kind of stuff or I'm somehow not allowed to vote, but I've I register and mm -hmm. vote anyhow, and that kind of stuff. I, I just read something today uh, that out of a whole bunch of elections totaling a um, like a billion votes over mm -hmm. some period of time in nationwide in localities and stuff, there were like thirty some yes. cases out 36. of a so out 36. of a billion. It's like. It's like way, way lower than being struck yeah. by lightning. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it was about 36 out of a billion. And this is a perfect example of voter suppression that I like to tell people is that we know that Hillary Clinton lost the election by less than half a million votes. Um, Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, under their current legislative body oh. and their governor has some of the worst voter suppression laws in the country. Um, so. There's an estimate of 250,000 people that were suppressed from the vote just in the state of Wisconsin. Uh -huh. Which would have flipped, which the, would have flipped, flipped the state. Where yeah. we would not only flip the state, but could potentially flip, flip the, the entire country. Right. Where we would not have Donald Trump as our current president. Right. And the voter suppression methods, they, they use like voter ID. Yes. Where you got to have a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. And if you're 80 years old, you might not know where your birth certificate is. If you mm -hmm. were born in in a at at home in rural Mississippi, you mm -hmm. there might not have been a real birth certificate like you think of mm -hmm. in a city, or you know if you're you're a refugee from someplace and mm -hmm. you become a citizen, but your birth certificate's back in mm -hmm. the other country. And mm -hmm. I mean there, uh, and I mean there's just all and that's just one kind of thing. Yeah. But there's all kinds of ways, lot just like they used to use poll taxes. Yeah. To, as, a, as an excuse exactly. to, to exclude. Yeah, and I mean, some of what you're seeing too with the different kinds of IDs, um, it's not just federally issued IDs that are being taken. Some states are actually picking and choosing different types of IDs that they are gonna allow people to use. So in the state of Texas, for example, students aren't allowed to use their student ID to vote, but people are allowed to use their rifle association IDs yeah, to vote. Yes, isn't that bizarre? Well, that's just, that, so that, who are you activating? It, it is skewed a certain mm -hmm. way for exactly. a certain purpose. Exactly. So what we're also seeing that's been happening, which is um, very unfortunate within the last election, is in a lot of southern states there has been purging of the yeah. voter rolls as well. So cross -check, yes, yeah. cross-checking. Yeah. Um, so what you what we know is that voter rolls are available to the public. I could walk into the Thurston County Elections Office right now and ask for the countywide. A voter file and it would give me just basic information with somebody's name, uh -huh. um, their registration status, if they're active. And so what certain interest groups were going out and doing is that they were having these voter ro rolls pulled and they were questioning people um, to mm -hmm. see if they were really registered to vote and if they were citizens. To me this is blatantly racist because we know that somebody whose name is Ebony Jones for example is a lot more likely mm -hmm. to be questioned about her status as a mm -hmm. registered voter compared to somebody like Bree Weeder, Bree Weeder, even though we both yeah. might be African American, uh -huh. it's there's those implicit biases based yeah. on people's names. And so they're pulling people out. There are thousands of people that weren't able to actually vote in time because once your name gets pulled out yeah. and questioned, you have to go through the whole entire registration process right. again. It's not same day registration. Exactly. Are specifically exactly 
targeting names that sound like minority yes. population, yeah. Yeah. specifically non-white yeah. non exactly. non people. Yeah. So they're targeting African Americans, mm -hmm. Latino, yes. Asian yes. Americans, yeah. anybody that's because yeah. they know those populists tend to vote more Democratic. Exactly. Right. So if they can say like Jose Garcia in, in Texas, and there's also one in Arizona, they, there's probably right. two different people, but they're saying they're the same person, yeah. which is ridiculous. Well, and, and this happened in the 2000 election that, that W won through the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. where in Florida, yes. where uh, Catherine Harris, who is the statewide official in charge of elections, was also the statewide chair of the George W. Bush That's campaign. Right. That's yes. right. And so she had a serious conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And they purged voters because of similarities of names. Mm -hmm. You might have a different middle initial, but that's close enough. If yes. they want to get your name off, they yank you that's out. What they're doing, and yeah. they were looking at things like, like felons mm -hmm. and other kinds of folks that they could get. And for the social security number, you, your social security number is nine digits. If they had five digits as matched, they said that was close enough. And they pulled people from the voter rolls with, with five digits, even though the other four didn't match, and got, they got away with it. Well, and what we've also been seeing as well is that organizations that are going out and doing voter registration drives, particularly in communities of color, have been targeted. Right, um, ACORN. Exactly, where all of the work that they've done in registering thousands of people and activating yeah. and getting yeah. them ready to go vote, they're now getting questioned. They were getting questioned yeah. uh, right before last November, conveniently enough, right after the uh, voter registration deadline had passed. Yeah. So now there were thousands of people that were pulled off and were not even able to register to vote in November's election. Yeah, we're, um, there are a lot of remedies for this kind yes. of stuff. <laughs> so, um, and I, I know you're, you're active with the Washington Voting Justice I Coalition, am. which works on yes. these kinds of issues. Um, and there are a number of remedies we're quite tight on time. Okay. Can you kind of <laughs> rattle off quickly some of the remedies that we need to do, and then sure. we'll provide people at the end of the program okay. with the website to connect with the Washington Voting Justice uh, Coalition. Sure, so the Washington State Legislature needs to pass the Voting Rights Act, the Washington State Voting Rights Act, passing automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, which has been brought up, prepaid postage, uh, which is very important. Yeah. Um, a lot of us believe that requiring a postage is still a poll tax, just in a yes. different form. Right. Um, Pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, the earlier we get young people activated and excited yeah. about voting, the more likely they are to be longtime voters yeah. and engaged and, in issues. And, and pay attention to exactly. the Democratic, uh, small d Democratic, exactly. the, for the process, mm -hmm. the, the public policy issues. And then also just um, smaller things that some people don't think about like making sure that we're providing in language access to folks where English yeah. might not be their first language, yeah. translation services, um, making sure that there are more ballot boxes. We just passed a law yeah. and that just got signed by the governor, which is really exciting, yes. is that we're now gonna have uh, up to 200 more ballot boxes across the state of Washington, which is gonna make it a lot easier. Um, some people had to put in two postage stamps on their um, ballot this last election just because yeah. they weren't close enough. So just trying to yeah. mitigate some of the basic problems. Yeah. That Here in Thurston County, we have a lot of drop boxes, so mm -hmm. you don't even have to put a stamp on it. Yeah. There are the, these public at public locations by mm -hmm. post offices and city hall and different, yeah. lots of different locations. You can just drop your ballot in you don't have to buy a stamp. Yeah. And that's that's really good because that's free. Exactly, and there's some counties, especially in Eastern Washington, where there will be one or two drop boxes for the entire county. And you gotta drive 30 miles exactly. to get there. That's not that's so not accessible. Bill that passed, we'll have a lot more ballot boxes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, uh, there, there is, there's talk about an initiative for the 2018 ballot, the yeah. Washington Voting Rights Act. Yes. And, and can you summarize what that's about? Yeah, I've talked about it a little bit. Um, so over 90% of local elections in Washington state are at large, uh, which means that the entire county gets to vote for, let's say, um, 10 people. I used to do work in Whatcom County, um, and they, at the time they were at large, which means that the entire county gets to vote for a certain set of people, uh, which disproportionately a lot of times makes it, so a lot of like what the issues that Colin was talking about, where it's not the fair representation where people are actually electing folks to office that represent the issues that are important to them. So what we're proposing with the Washington Voting Rights Act is, and this would not happen 
um, throughout the entire state, but when circumstances come up where it's necessary, like what we saw with Yakima, for example, is that we would change the rules and have um, districts instead of just at-large county elections. And so we've been really, we have a lot of great advocates that have been working with us. Um, Senator Sam Hunt is a really big outspoken proponent yeah. of the Washington Voting Rights Act. And so we are currently working with him, hopefully to get this passed next year, depending on the makeup of, or er, 2018, yeah. depending on the makeup of the Washington State Legislature. But if not, there is talk about going to a ballot initiative. And it's just about making sure that every voice is heard and that representation actually happens. Yeah. It just goes back to all the issues we've been talking about today. We want to make sure that people are proportionally represented in office. It helps people feel like their voice is being heard, um, helps people stay engaged, makes for a more vibrant democracy, which makes for a better country. Well, yeah. you're going to have wiser public exactly. policy decisions exactly. if more people have a voice in it. Exactly. Right. So it, it, yeah. that should be a common sense thing. Yes. I, I want to check in a bit about the different groups that you folks work with, and we are tight on time, so we want to be relatively uh, 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 concise here. But you work, Cindy, with uh, a great statewide organization, Fix Democracy First, and I've been a member of the predecessor organization um, uh, for many years. Uh, tell us just a bit about what Fix Democracy First does. And is, the website is www.fixdemocracyfirst.org. <laughs> So basically, um, our mission statement is that we advocate for fair elections and good government policy that support the will of the people and not the power of money. So we focus on democracy-related issues. We, we do legislative advocacy work, like we supported those bills that Bree mentioned. Um, we will support um, the Washington Voting Rights Act next year um, in 2018. We're also continuing the push for the 28th Amendment. We passed Initiative 735 last year, 63% calling for constitutional amendments. So we're getting our congressional delegation on board. We're supporting public financing of elections, like with Honest Election Seattle and looking for other opportunities. And then we also have, we do civic engagement and um, involvement in the community. We're working with Fair Vote, Washington Voting Justice Coalition. So we do coalition work as well. Yeah. But we support anything that moves democracy forward and um, educating the public, civic engagement, pulling people in to get more engaged with democracy. Yeah, and I should mention all of these organizations that you folks work with and that I'm mentioning and that we'll provide links to through our website are not partisan at all. Yeah. It's like based on the principles involved, here's yes. what we need if you're gonna have a vibrant and effective democracy. Yes. And then you can be in whatever, big mm -hmm. parties, small parties, whatever, that's uh, another thing, but the <laughs> thing is you gotta have good procedures. So thanks. Uh, Colin, you work with Fair Vote Washington, and I've long been giving money to mm -hmm. Fair Vote at the national level yeah. to support what they've been doing, and they do a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, tell us just briefly about the national level and then the state level of Fair Vote sure. Washington. Uh, so nationally, Fair Vote uh, is advocating for electoral reform to make elections more representative uh, along in the lines of what we've been talking about. Um, and a, a, a good example is talking about ranked choice voting, proportional voting. Uh, and like one of the issues with all the districts or all the elections being at large in say Whatcom County are if you live in Bellingham and you're 60% of the population and you each are voting for each five of the seats, then that same 60% elects yeah. all five of the seats and you have the same 40% that gets no representation yeah. from that graphic yeah. earlier. Uh, so they're advocating for uh, reforming that system. They were uh, big proponents of the effort uh, in Maine uh, this last year in 2016 yeah. where they got ranked choice voting to be passed. So now Maine will be using ranked choice voting to elect their congressional representatives, their uh, so, yeah. uh, governor and their statewide offices. Uh, so they're a really great organization. And then uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Fair Vote Washington, uh, along with a guy up in Bellingham named Alan McConkey, who's a great guy. Uh, and we're here trying to advocate for some similar reforms, uh, pushing uh, a lot for ranked choice voting, both in our local elections and uh, statewide. And we're trying to uh, be a, a call to arms to make our representation more representative. Um, I want to follow up with you about something that, that uh, one of Fair Vote's relatively new activities, they're promoting the Fair Representation Act, and this would be a good remedy for some of what we've been discussing. Yeah. Uh, can you put in a pitch for that? And I want to let the viewers know that you can visit www.fairvote.org, click the 
advocacy tab on that website and it'll have information about the Fair Representation Act. Can you give us a, a summary of what that's about? Yeah, so the Fair Representation Act is a, a bill that Fair Vote has proposed. It's ready to go to Congress and, and get passed into law tomorrow. Uh, a lot of folks think that in order to change the way we elect our congressional representatives, it would require a constitutional amendment. But that's not true. Our constitution doesn't specify how we elect our congressional representatives. Uh, if this act were to be passed tomorrow, uh, we would switch to a ranked choice voting and proportional election system. So we would start having super districts uh, where instead of one district electing one person, uh, you have larger districts electing multiple people. And all of a sudden, California is going to send a few more Republicans. Texas is going to send a few more Democrats. Eastern Washington is going to send a few more Democrats. And right in the heart of liberal Seattle, you're going to send some more Republicans. And overall, more people everywhere get more representation. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be a, a partisan issue. Yeah. And this, this could work to the benefit of minority parties. Absolutely. So there may be some Greens, some Libertarians, depending on how things shake out and what other whatever other reforms come along. You're, you're no longer having to vote that's against right. someone. You can vote yeah. for the candidate you like best. Yeah, yeah, and that's an important principle, I think. The problems that we've been discussing are significant and powerful forces, as we've been saying, have been causing and perpetuating these problems. And, uh, but nevertheless, most Americans and most voters really want a better democracy. We really want um, to avoid cynicism, mm -hmm. and we can solve these problems. So I, I appreciate that besides having a good critique of the problems, you folks actually have some very practical uh, remedies. And once in a while we win. Uh, Cindy, you, you mentioned already in November 2016 um, that, that we passed, I think you might have mentioned, initiative 735. 735, 63% of the vote, that's a landslide. Can you summarize uh, what 735 does. Yeah, basically it was um, calling on um, our congressional delegation here in Washington State, our U.S. Uh, delegation, to put forth a constitutional amendment that would overturn the decisions like Citizens United. It's basically saying that corporations and other legal entities are not persons and do not deserve constitutional rights like human beings do. Money does not equal free speech. Political contribution should yeah. be allowed to be regulated and made public. Yeah, so we had this landslide of 63% of the voters. And we said, passed yeah. all 10 congressional districts, too. Oh, I didn't know that, that's yep. good. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's, that sentiment is, yes. is widely dispersed yep. statewide. Um, we've got um, some other problems, we've got some other solutions. Uh, we have this entity called Honest Elections Seattle. There's a, an effort called Take the Initiative at the website www.taketheinitiative.us that helps su support progressive signature gatherers in Washington State. Um, there are ways that we can improve how we count votes instead of these voting machines that can be programmed and, and screwed up in all kinds of ways. There's some remedies there. You might want to look at some of these companies that are creating some of this equipment. And that are actually owned by highly partisan yes, Republicans. very much so. And yes. they have a conflict of interest. Yes. So that's something. Um, the, uh, in, in this series, the program we taped in November, for November 2009, focused entirely on getting big money out of politics. Um, and you can watch this through our website, www.olympiafor.org. Click the TV programs link, scroll down to November 2009, and click that episode's title, Voter-Owned Elections Replace Special Interests Big Money Financing. And I'm saying this because not only is it a great program to watch along these lines, but there's a, a concept that I want to get to here. Um, the, and the point is that the things that we're talking about are important no matter what other issues you care about. If you care about the climate, if you care about single-payer health care, if you care about stopping the waste on, on military weapons systems that we don't need, whatever your issue is, genetically modified foods, you name it, um, the, whatever issue you care about is being hampered because of the problems that, that we're talking about here. Yep. Yes. 100%. So. In our November 2009 program, I interviewed the late Craig Salins, who was a great friend and worked really, really hard on your predecessor organization, mm -hmm. um, uh, Washington Public Campaigns that evolved into Fix Washington, Fix Democracy First. One of the things that Craig said during that interview, and I've been quoting ever since 2009, he said this, 
scratch any issue, energy, healthcare, environment, decisions about taxes and budgets, and you'll find that special interest money is calling the shots. And what he urged during the interview is what I just said a moment ago, that whatever other issue you work on, this needs to be your other primary issue. So you have two primary issues. One is your climate work, and the other is get big money out of the, the campaigns, or it's whatever your other issue is plus, plus this. So I think that's important. Um, I want to thank our guests for, for being our uh, knowledgeable experts on these topics and having good approach. I want I thank uh, uh, Bree Weeder, Colin Cole, Cindy Black. I want to thank the folks who've been watching. At the website for the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, we will list more than a dozen organizations working on these issues. Besides the ones we mentioned, there are a lot more that are really very good. Visit www.olympiafor.org, click the TV programs link, scroll down to July 2017, and next to the link for watching this program is a Word document that will summarize very thoroughly what our guest said, and it'll provide at the end of that document a list of a lot of good organizations. So I want to thank, again, you folks. I want to thank the viewers. Um, and almost everybody in the United States knows that our election systems are broken in a bunch of ways, and we really do have remedies, as our guests have said. Democracy has to be based in grassroots people power. Please help. You can get information about a lot of issues from the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. We are all one human family. We all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to work at it, and the world needs your help. Thanks.